Okay, I think we'll get started um, and hopefully the stragglers will not miss any of the juicy conversation with some of the introductions. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for being here. My name is Emily Riley. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at BGC and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program. I am a white woman with auburn curly hair. I'm wearing a cobalt blue cardigan and I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land we are hosting this event from. Many cities and institutions in America were founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land, Manhattan, from which we are hosting this event. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Rockaway nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as intertribal trade lands under the stewardship of many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native American, First Nations, and Indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. If you'd like to learn more about the land you are on, if you're in the States today, you can click on the link that will be posted in the chat shortly. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge those whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their own free will and whose tremendous cultural, economic and technological contributions continue to provide the foundations for our lives. This is our first program celebrating the exhibition that we have just opened at our Graduate Center, Majolica Mania. We have a, a, a whole roster of programs. Um, the next one will be October 21. Uh, titled Racing Whimsy, Black and Asian Figures in the Majolica Imaginary, featuring Adrienne L. Child, Sequoia Mira and I Miller, excuse me, and Iris Moon, and we'll post a link to that in the chat as well. Uh, we are joined today by Pro Bono ASL. They'll be providing American Sign Language interpretation for this event, so welcome, Pro Bono. There is closed captioning available at the bottom of your screen. You can either hide those captions or enable them, whatever works for you. This event is being recorded and it'll be posted to YouTube in October. And we invite you to submit questions throughout the program as we will talk for about 30, 40 minutes and then we'll open the floor for questions. As a question comes to you, please just throw it in the Q&A chat and um, we will address it when we get to the questions part of the program. And um, we're saving the chat today for appreciation. So if you want to have your question answered, please use the Q&A function. There's a whole bunch of programs and events happening at BGC this semester. So if you're keen to learn more, you can look at our events page as well. So welcome to Making Majolica Mania with Susan Weber, Earl Martin, and Laura McCrulis. Those three make up the curatorial team that made this exhibition happen. I'm going to briefly introduce them. I'm not going to read their full bios, but if you want to uh, read through their full list of amazing accomplishments, you can follow the link that we'll be posting in a moment to the event page for this um, uh, event, and you can read them there. Um, so Earl Martin is an associate curator at Bard Graduate Center. Earl is a specialist in design and decorative arts of the 19th and 20th centuries. Dr. Laura McCrulis is a research curator at Bard Graduate Center, a material culture scholar with a specialization in 19th century decorative arts and design. And um, Dr. Susan Weber is the founder and director of Bard Graduate Center, where she is the Iris Horowitz Professor in the History of Decor Decorative Arts. And Susan has curated countless exhibitions and authored numerous publications and catalogs. And if you want a full list of that, you can also look at her bio on the events page. So welcome everybody, happy to be here. I'm gonna just kick us off with the question, with the first question, um, and this is to Susan. Susan, tell us how the exhibition originated. How did it begin? How did you come to the decision to do this exhibition and what was interesting about it for you? Well, the exhibition began, I would say some seven years ago with the prompting of BGC board member Philip English and his wife Deborah, who were major collectors of British Majolica, as well as founding members of the Majolica International Society. And I went to Baltimore to see their magnificent collection. 
and through them began to visit other collections in the United States. And I tried to um, read up on the subject, but um, really in order to um, cover up um, the fact about how little I knew about the material. And um, I was really amazed at how little scholarly um, interest there was in the ceramic field, how few um, books there were with two um, exceptions, two early books um, uh, published in the 80s, um, Amajalika, one by um, um, Joan Graham Stack and um, another by Victoria Burgesson. And um, I thought um, how such a sort of underrated or understudied or undervalued um, topic really overlapped with um, BGC's mission, which was to study and explore under, um, under studied areas of the decorative arts. And um, to me, it was very strange that um, Majolica is considered like the greatest 19th century invention in ceramic history. And yet, if you read a lot of um, ceramic historians and their attitudes toward it, I mean, you get things like it's low, vulgar, I mean, even barbarous. And yet, um, it's this great 19th century invention. It's a virtual mania in the 19th century. Um, most museums in the world, um, with the exception of um, a few that have strong um, ceramic or pottery departments, don't collect it. Or even if they had it, they deaccessioned it. And um, it, it was just the sort of um, subject that um, tickled um, my fancy as well as um, those of other um, scholars and curators at the Bard Graduate Center. And so we put together a team and had a scientific meeting of that team at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Um, and then um, this led to um, visits around the world, frankly, and um, I'm going to let Laura and Earl speak more about the research process that went into this exhibition. Yeah, great. Laura, Earl, you, uh, from what I understand, started this project as relative Majolica newbies. And uh, over the past few years, I would, I would hazard to say that you've become somewhat experts in the field. So can you talk a little bit about the research process that went into realizing the exhibition and the accompanying three volume catalog. Um, and maybe also talk about how your understanding of Majolica changed as you got deeper into this area. Well, I, I think I was there just a bit before Laura. So I was at this initial meeting in London um, with our sort of scientific panel of experts, if you will. And, you know, we, we were all learning, I think, as we went along very much. And at that same trip, we took um, a tour of the V&A's collection, which is one of the better collections of Majolica in the world. Um, uh, and then also went up to Stoke-on-Trent where the sort of, uh, the, the material was first uh, sort of developed by Minton Company. And we were able to visit um, the Potteries Museum, the Wedgman Museum and Archive and really also spend a lot of time with the Minton archive, which is, was sort of newly available again to scholars at the time that we were there in 2015, 2016. Um, and I think that really grounded us in sort of some of the archival resources and just set us off. And very quickly, I think with the meeting and all the, the visits to the various institutions and archives in that trip, we realized we had a huge topic that was very ripe for exploration and wonderful materials that we could draw upon there too. So in terms of exhibition objects and illustrations. Um, and maybe Laura might wanna talk about our, 
our transition to the United States since that's where she came in a lot. Of yeah, um, I was actually hired in May of 2017 to research the American part of the Majelica story. And unlike the English makers, there wasn't a, a large deposit of, of archives to sort through. So it was a more piecemeal approach. I traveled to Trenton, New Jersey, East Liverpool, Ohio, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Earl and I both went to Baltimore. Um, basically information was gleaned through local libraries and historical societies, um, as well as some museums. Um, but what we really ended up relying on uh, were trade publications and local newspapers published during the 19th century. And believe it or not, Ancestry.com was, was critical to um, untangling the individual stories of these, of these potters. Um, also, some fascinating details emerged through uh, reading the Dunn uh, Credit Reports, which is an archive held by the Harvard Business School Library. And these credit reports were, a, the Dunn Company was the precursor to Dunn and Bradstreet. So these, these credit reports were kind of fascinating reading. They were generated by actual physical visits to various businesses. Um, and depending on who was doing the reporting, the individual would write down what the business was up to, sometimes salacious details about the the, the owners or you know, who was working there, just to sort of gauge what the credit worthiness of the companies were. Um, so through those sort of odd sources, we were able to piece together some really interesting histories. But I would, I, I would say that the most important part of the research process, whether it was English or American firms, was simply the amount of time that we were able to spend with the objects. Um, and because there weren't a lot of museums that had collections of the American objects in particular, we actually acquired quite a few of them and um, have a wonderful study collection at this point. And we were very much indebted to our, our very generous lenders who private lenders, I think, would are approximately 90% of the exhibition at least. And, and those lenders and especially in the New York area and Baltimore um, were integral to our sort of learning curve. I think all of us were like, what the heck is all this stuff when we first went into one of those amazing collections and then very quickly sort of started looking at things and were encouraged to handle things. And it was very much a- And clean and clean. And, <laughs> <laughs> cleaned, a lot, cleaned a lot of Majolica in the process. For um, photography purposes. For photography, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, really handling, handling the objects was just so critical to our understanding um, overall, um, because I entered this project with a very strong foundation in 19th century design, but I, I had no experience with ceramics at all. Um, so it was a pretty steep learning curve. <laughs> Okay, speaking of a learning curve, Susan, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the evolution of the exhibition. Um, what did you think it would be about initially, and then how did that change as the process went on? Well, we were very lucky, I must say, and we we're extremely grateful to the Majolica International Society, which I mention again, because they provided us a research and development grant for us to establish the project. And um, they, um, the Englishes who live in Baltimore also introduced us to the Walters Art Museum. Um, and they um, were very interested in the exhibition. Um, they already had um, many of the fine pieces from the English collection in their galleries. Um, they also have an amazing ceramic collection, incredibly strong. And um, we met a young um, British curator there named Joe Briggs, who is um, the fourth curator of this exhibition, which we failed to mention in our opening. And so um, 
we were um, able to um, put the, um, the forces of our two institutions together and, um, and approach the subject. Now, when we first began, we were over ambitious, I must say. And um, we thought we could do a show on the history of Majolica worldwide. Well, um, we learned very quickly that there were so many makers in so many different countries that that would just be impossible. And, um, and I'm also um, sort of amused by the fact that um, we, we, what we outlined for the catalog was a 10 chapter catalog. And um, as we learned more and unearthed um, more, more and more archival research and learned by, frankly, we bought a tremendous amount of this exhibition on eBay <laughs> and at um, different um, majolica and ceramic sales all through the world. And um, we, we learned it, and a lot about um, different makers, particularly British makers and American ma makers. And we thought that with the show originating in, in the US of A, why not? Um, have a show that um, looked at the work that developed in Great Britain and then um, sort of bounced across the Atlantic to um, major um, towns and cities in the US, mostly on the backs of British potters, I must say, who brought their, their techniques and their, their recipe books. And um, and so we, um, we trimmed it down, um, the, um, the, the worldwide survey to a look at um, British firms and American firms. And the American firms were really interesting to us because so many of them um, that still, um, that existed in the 19th century um, were successful because of their Majolica production. And um, so we, um, we, and we found so little written about the American firms um, and their Majolica production that we thought this, is, this would be really interesting to American audiences. So um, here we are with a three volume Majolica um, publication. And um, frankly, um, we could, we could do a, probably another nine or 10 Majolica exhibitions um, from all that we've seen and learned and, um, and grasped. Great. And so Laura and Earl, I mean, we started having conversations about programs for this years ago now. Um, and so I'm just wondering from your perspective, how has your opinions about Majolica changed or what is, what, what's the thing about this exhibition that really excited you as you started to go deeper with the material? Oh, I would also just note that the beautiful catalog is behind Earl on the shelf there, but we'll also post a little link in the chat. Um, go ahead, Earl. Well, I was gonna say, I, I've sort of been a ceramic nerd most of my life. So that's sort of been something I've always been interested in, but you know, in, in my training, I think a lot of it focused on earlier materials. So, you know, Renaissance Maiolica, 18th century, Sev, and, and English wares from Wedgwood and things like that, which are seminal developments in the history of ceramics. And then I personally, at the time I was in grad school, was more interested in 20th century modern movements. And I focused more on ceramics in that period. Um, and then, you know, I came to the Bar Greta Center a few years ago, as Susan knows, and started working with Susan, who, who doesn't do 20th century too much, um, and sort of got introduced especially to the 19th century um, with our uh, John Lockwood Kipling exhibition, one of Susan's previous shows. Um, and, you know, I hadn't really done a lot of, sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> Um, I hadn't done a lot of focusing on the 19th century and ceramics world. And I think 
one of the amazing things that you do once you start looking at 19th century ceramics is the amazing innovations, um, the, um, the, the just sheer, sheer size and scope of the material that's made in the 19th century. Um, so chemical innovations, all these things come through in, in a, for a ceramics focus is, is just amazing. And then I think just the reflection on the developments of that history, that period, which are really reflected in the material. I don't know. Laura, what, what do you think? <laughs> um, well, as I said, I, I, I came to this, I came to this project with really no experience in ceramics. And um, so this was a wonderful opportunity to just sort of ground myself in a different medium. And um, what I really enjoyed about learning about Majelica was just, its widespread appeal was just so extraordinary to me. I mean, it, it was sold initially to the aristocracy and, and, and Queen Victoria. And then decades later, we see it advertised to American housewives all over the country. Um, and we know this because of newspaper ads, you know, that were, that were advertising Majelica you know, in, in the rural Midwest in, in the 1880s. Um, so I, 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 I like that aspect of Majelica that it was such a sort of egalitarian type of product. I like the fact that it's like, most of it is actually um, useful wares so that we can talk, we can tell a lot about um, society at the time just based on what was produced. Um, and I also like the fact that um, at the very, very high end, on the other hand, um, it was actually considered, you know, a work of art. I mean, they, a lot of the more uh, well-capitalized firms were able to hire sculptors to, to, to design their models and, and academically trained painters to paint their models. So I, I, there's, a, there's something for everyone in Majelica, I guess is what I'm saying. So it's been, it's been a great journey. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. You mentioned a little bit about the sort of use or, or the reflective um, attitude that this, this ceramic work can have. Susan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the use of Majelica. How are various culinary trends reflected in the objects? Um, how does Majolica reflect changes in interiors in the 19th century? How, how is it storytelling about the period? Well, first of all, Majolica was made in a great variety of both useful and ornamental goods, large and small, um, ranging from pieces for the tabletop to use in the garden and conservatory with um, such things as um, garden pots and stands and um, wall brackets. And um, there's a tremendous range. I mean, there are items for smoking, such as ashtrays, and um, uh, there are items for spitting called cups, cups of boards. Um, um, there are items for decorating the tables, such as candlesticks and centerpieces. But Frankly, um, my favorites are those that are made for dining, such as um, oyster plates, sardine boxes, um, fish plates, cheese stands, um, strawberry sets. And these really reflected the increasing um, foodstuffs available in town and country due to improvements in uh, transportation uh, the expansion of the railways, um, the invention of um, refrigerated boxcars, um, an expanding um, economy, um, a larger middle class with um, more dis disposable income. And um, there, um, there are just so many um, different types of um, pieces such as teapots, which reflect um, the um, taking of um, high tea in um, both the, um, the upper classes and the middle classes now. Um, 
so we can tell so much through the the objects themselves about how people dined, um, the importance of of dining. Um, it's we also have to remember this is the time of a great many um, women's um, books um, and manuals about how to furnish a home and um, how to um, be um, genteel like in the home and people had great aspirations um, to live better and um, and they ate better too and um, this we see with all the different types of um, tabletop wares that are made now um, what's also important is the importance of color um, majolica is splashed with all of these um, sort of very limpid colors that um, are so um, beautiful because they are full of lead, which um, as you know, um, lead um, leads to lead poisoning. And we're gonna discuss this in a few minutes, but the Victorian era saw an explosion of color in, in the interior, in the decorative arts. And um, it's also the time of um, um, colored print media because there are advancements in synthetic dyes and these expand the range of colors available um, for textiles, for carpets, for wallpaper. And um, there's this same um, expression and appreciation of um, bright colors is seen in ceramics, particularly majolica. And this is the time because of this explosion of color in the industries that um, a greater sector of the population can have color in their homes. Up until now, um, white was the color of the poor. Um, whitewash was the cheapest um, thing you could put on your walls. White ceramics um, were coarse and um, very inexpensive and um, if you um, aspired to be um, middle class or beyond, um, that meant the introduction of color in your interiors as a status symbol. So um, Majolica fits perfectly into um, the Victorian interior, particularly because um, of this idea of that we all have a Victorian houses filled with clutter and filled with bric-a-brac. And majolica often was part of um, these ornamental objects found in a Victorian home. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, just as a side note, these amazing uh, sort of whimsical designs, our teens have been working on an interpretation project that'll be going online soon. And they got obsessed with the lettuce plates. They loved the lettuce plates. Um, so it really captures the imagination even today as well. Okay, so you, Susan, you mentioned a little bit about the, this, this, the lead that is used in the glazes. Um, so while Majolica is an industrial product, or pro um, it was largely produced through hands-on processes performed by workers. Can you discuss a little bit the stories of the people behind Majolica, the little histories that go on? underneath the surface of these very beautiful pieces? And, and how did you f uncover these histories? Because I'm, I'm guessing they're not sort of recorded in the canon in the way that um, sort of big designs by designers are. Well, the effects of majolica glazes on um, the workers and the very poor um, work um, environment that um, pottery workers um, languished in um, is a um, sort of not so well-known part of the story. And um, pottery workers were, un were um, badly um, paid. They um, were exposed to um, dust and the glaze, which led to um, plumism, which has led poisoning. Um, children um, from a very early age were um, 
were used in the um, in the potteries to do the um, the work that um, grownups didn't want to do the really terrible sweat filled work. Women did a lot of the painting, um, and all all were exposed to lead. Um, they um, suffered inc incredibly. They um, um, lived um, very shortened lives. And um, until studies were done in the 80s and 90s about workplace reform and the, um, the condition of the factories, um, this continued. And um, once um, the, um, the damage of lead to the workers was exposed, um, changes began to make in the, in the factory. Um, American factories um, also saw these, these findings and studies that were published in um, American ceramics journals and um, changes were made in, in the settings um, of the um, ceramic potteries for the workers. So um, to commemorate all those untold um, victims, um, we decided to, um, to tell the story of the factories, which you will find in a beautiful essay in our um, volume by Miranda Goodby, the ceramics curator at the Potteries Museum um, and Art Galleries in Stoken on Trent. And we um, um, got a, um, an incredible um, artist named um, McConnell to do a memorial installation of, um, of the many um, unnamed workers that, that perished um, working for the potteries. And can we put that up? Because I think it would be yeah. really nice to, to take a look at it and That's think great. of all of these pottery workers who made this fantastic stuff, but at a great price to themselves. Uh Absolutely, doing this right now for us. One moment, everybody. Yeah, that's that's Walter's enormous piece in the shape of a, an Indian stupa, and um, I think with its sort of ghostly um, white glaze and coloration, um, it, it, it really um, feels like a memorial. And if you look closely, you'll see all sorts of ceramics that were made. And um, some of the um, people are memorialized in it. And there are um, many, um, we found many photographs um, in the Potteries Museum of the workers and um, he has used those photographs as a jumping off point for um, many of these figures of um, all ages and um, backgrounds. Great, thank you, Susan. Laura, Earl, would you wanna contribute anything to this sort of any anecdotal stories that you can tell us now about um, any of these people or anything you'd like to offer? I have a happy story I could tell. <laughs> Great. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we, we used Ancestry.com quite a bit to sort of untangle all of these, these individual stories. And I, I focus particularly on um, a lot of the, of the American potters. But as we mentioned before, one really important narrative of the exhibition was the, the, the immigrant story, the transfer of uh, skill, skills and capital and recipe books and molds and designs from England to the United States. Um, so one particular potter, uh, I've, I've kind of called him my favorite over, <laughs> over, over the period of our journey here. Um, one particular potter by the name of Richard Harrison has, has a, an interesting story. Um, he was born in the potteries in a large uh, family full of potters. I think he had seven brothers and uh, his father was also a potter. But 
they all left in the 1840s and we were able to trace the whole his whole career trajectory in the united states he arrived in new york then went to east liverpool ohio as i said it, that's a uh, very significant center for ceramic production or at least it was in the 19th century um, after a series of of failed businesses he even went into business with some of his his brothers he ends up back in new york city and then eventually moves to Peekskill, New York, which is north of, of New, York, uh, New York City. And he establishes this single pottery kiln. Uh, and this is relatively late in his career. He's probably in his 60s at the time. And he produces Majolica for nearly 15 years in Peekskill. And what's so wonderful about his work is that unlike a lot of the American potteries where we find lots of copies of of english models most of what he produced was strikingly original really quirky in design and it's my assumption that he was he was like a one-man band he probably did the designs made the molds the the glazes are a little wonky they're kind of strange colors and um he obviously produced the produced the the glazes on site um it just to me it's like the it's it's a wonderful example of entrepreneurial spirit and and creativity and perseverance and um the best part of his of of his story is that the maker's mark that he marked all of his work with or nearly all of his work reads tenuous majolica in capital letters and so I'm not sure he had, perhaps he had a odd sense of humor, but <laughs> I don't really know what that means. And um, I think that kind of set him apart from from the other makers in a in a really important way. So maybe I'll just share a couple of anecdotes uh, related to um, education and sort of more progressive values. I think it was interesting to discover. So early on in England, Minton and Company, uh, headed by Herbert Minton initially, and then Colin Minton Campbell, uh, members of the same family, um, was very supportive of the early sort of art education efforts in, in the country and really um, basically paid for their, their workers to be educated in art and design. And really, we were able to uncover a few of those, those folks um, in our installation and even as recently as you know after the book was published we discovered oh this thing is designed or painted by one of these early um british artists um which minton really supported in their sort of their artistry and their education and i think the i focused my, in my chat one of my chapters on um the baltimore factories which were two um and there was a man named David Francis Haynes, who was the head of the Chesapeake Pottery, and he also was very, I think, an interesting figure to, you know, had become a merchant and, and a wholesaler initially and then bought a pottery factory and, but, and brought in English sort of expertise in terms of people and work and um, sort of overseers, if you will, or managers but also then went to the Maryland, what's now the Maryland College of Art, um, to to engage sort of mostly women as decorators and to bring them in to sort of working in the potteries and and earning a sort of fair wage and sort of being somewhat unusual in that way at least in the united states uh for supporting sort of women in the workplace at that time so some of these small histories which you know we we can't know who the exactly everyone was but we we were given some windows into this sort of fascinating period, really. Thank you, Earl, Laura, Susan. Um, we're gonna move to questions. So those of you who have posted questions in the Q&A, thank you. And those of you that have questions, now's the moment to, um, to share those with us and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. I'm also gonna share my screen and, and just share some install shots of the exhibition so you can really get a sense of what this exhibition is like in space 
And so I'm going to hand over emceeing of the Q&A to Earl, um, and I will share my screen. So we have one question that's not in the Q&A. So put your questions in the Q&A, but one question not in the Q&A um, from Esther Marlowe. Um, and she's asking about the, I think, the, the dangerous qualities of the ingredients. Um, so as Susan discussed, there was a heavy amount of lead in the glazes that were used to create this ware. So the, the, the proportion of lead was somewhere between 40 and 60% generally. And that lead and those glazes when they were not yet fired, so when they're painted on, when they're drying and, and the dust that might come from that, that all is where the lead would be sort of ingested and, and you know, absorbed through the skin and things like that by the workers. And that's where we, we see a heavy impact on, on the people working in the factories there. But once that, that glaze is fired, once it goes through the process of the high temperatures of the kiln, it's transformed chemically. And it really is, it's very hard to extract any sort of detrimental um, lead from it um, after that you you would have to work really hard you have to almost eat glaze and you or you would have to soak something very acidic in it for weeks to get any measurable amount of of lead from the the the, the majolica after it's been fired in the kiln so what you would find today is probably not going to hurt you if you were to use it <laughs> and then So a question is um, from a, an anonymous attendee. I thought Majolica originated much earlier than the 19th century and that it did not originate in England. Perhaps I misunderstood the origin. So would Susan or Laura like to take on the Majolica Majolica question I think we have there? Oh, Susan, I think you're muted. Okay, first of all, everyone mixes up, even us in the beginning, the difference between myolica, which is the Renaissance tin glazed ware, and majolica is the 19th century ware um, invented by Leon Arnaud at Minton in 1850 51. And that is. Um, often called palissy ware as it was then. And a few years later, they um, termed it majolica with a J. And um, there was um, a lot of industrial intrigue we learned at our last symposium between England and France and the, the making of the glaze and the colors. And um, so I think that um, will um, maybe untangle what you're thinking. Um, and um, it's a tremendously um, eclectic um, a ceramic form. It um, has many different sources. Um, this is, as you know, the age of um, eclecticism and historicism. And so there are um, majolica pieces that are very imitative of Myolica from the Renaissance. Um, there are pieces that um, imitate um, 18th century Sevres porcelain, um, medieval tankards. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very long list. I, I hope that um, untangles um, your understanding and sets it straight a bit. We have a some a sort of question that kind of would follow on from that. Um, how are the colors achieved? And so, I would say, even I'm the more ceramics nerd amongst the group, and but I'm not going to be the chemist that really needs to answer that question. But I would say basically that there was a huge amount of study in chemistry and developments in 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 isolating chemicals and minerals and purifying them through the late through the 18th century and especially into the 19th century that led up to this ability to create um, 
a set of glazes, uh, Leonard knows at Minton's major innovation was to create a set of glazes that would allow them to achieve different colors that all could be really fired at the same temperature. So they're temperature compatible in the kiln. So you could glaze a number of different colors on one piece and then fire it all at the same time. And that would allow for uh, you know, something that was less expensive, less sort of processes to go through to get to that end product. And that's really one of the innovations we see in the reason the color becomes so widespread after this innovation by Arno. And the actual chemical developments, I believe, for one of our material scientists, which we will have a program about lead glazes later in, in the, the season in October. And maybe Jen Mass can answer some of those questions then. Um, let's see. <clears throat> oh, dear. Um, Earl, what there's a question about um, fat and molasses saturated pieces. Didn't we get some of those and have to clean them? Well, we we didn't do too much of that, but we did work with a, a conservator restorer um, who who did sort of lighten up a couple of pieces for us. And I don't actually know absolutely the the method. I think it involves uh, sort of uh, more industrial grade peroxide soaking and, and other processes. But I, again, am I going to plead some ignorance there as well? Um, it's not something you should try at home. It's generally, I would say the answer to that as well, um, unless you've trained a bit in this area. Um, Catherine Mosher asked, will she repeat the potter's name? I think, Laura, that was probably for you. Richard, and, uh, Richard Harrison, and he was the proprietor of the Peekskill Pottery. Thank you. Um, we have a question, what makes something Majolica? Um, from Langley Deaver. Um, so again, we have this development in 1851, uh, 1850 or so by Minton of these thermal compatic glazes. Um, and so the, the glaze development is, is certainly part of the, these heavily leaded glazes. Um, and this sort of spreads from Minton sort of through trade and secrets kind of spreading very easily in the ceramics world. Um, and it continues through the 19th century. I don't know if Laura or Susan, you want to add more than that? Um, well, I think it's important to note that even during the, the peak of Majolica, that the definition was somewhat loose. Um, as long as it was earthenware um, covered in some sort of lead-based glaze, it tended to be called Majolica. I mean, typically molded with exuberant forms, it, it tended to be called Majolica. Um, so yeah, and especially when it spread to America, it was, um, the, de the definition was definitely problematic. Uh, we know that one American maker in particular, George Morley out of East Liverpool, Ohio, um, used a, uh, I guess it's a, Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it a stoneware bot? No, it's a it's a ironware body. Ironstone. Ironstone, sorry. <laughs> Ironstone body, which is is fired at a much higher temperature than um, than a more sort of porous earthenware body. Um, we have a question from Rita Cohen. When did the working conditions start to improve and what did they do to improve them? Well, I can answer that. Um, working conditions started to improve at the end of the 1880s and the beginning of the um, 1890s. There were um, studies done by hospitals and doctors um, 
there were um, a series of ins inspections started with standards that had to be met um, with providing um, um, work, air, work areas where there was um, better air circulation and, um, and heat, heat and all sorts of um, um, rules and regulations about the protection of um, workers and um, those um, pottery owners who didn't um, adhere to the new stricter rules um, were fined. And um, because of these um, stricter rules and regulations um, and um, there was the, uh, and the encouragement to, um, to use something else than lead in glaze. Um, Majolica basically is not as popular. It's going out of style. I think it's also a matter of taste. Um, people um, were beginning to, to tire over all the different colors of it. And also you have to remember that in 1870, there was comp um, compulsory education started in England so um, children had to go to school. So there were less children found in the potteries. And so um, working conditions um, really began to improve. And those were followed um, a, about a decade later in the United States as well. Um, we have a, question, a couple questions that I think are fairly short to answer. Uh, is Bordalo Pinheiro pottery considered Majolica? So I would say early production by that is a Spanish firm as far as I understand, which we did not focus on, but yeah, some of that is considered Majolica. It does, it, it does go on um, after the founder, uh, which I think that is his name, after the founder dies around the early 19th, early 20th century. And is still producing today, and today I would, it's not considered Majolica. Um, it's not the same type of glazes or method of production. Um, and it's sort of Majolica style, some of the wear though, that, you know, it, it looks like, it's looking back some of the wear to the 19th century forms and colors, I would say. Um, and then there is another question in the, the chat about, is it still being manufactured? And similarly, because of the changes in uh, laws and, and tastes, so we have a less interest in these bright colors and these, um, uh, especially in the 1870s and 80s, and sure there's a taste change that happens with you know, arts and crafts movement, the aesthetic movement tastes coming in more strongly. Um, and also at the same time, as Susan said, there's a lot more regulation and protection for workers and that basically by the middle of the 20th century, and it's actually quite late, um, lead is, is sort of phased out almost entirely from glazes. And so Majolica glazes aren't really able to be achieved after so the 1930s or so. Um, um, Earl, if I can correct you, um, Bordalo is a, port is a Portuguese factory. Okay. I knew it was either Spain or Portugal, but thanks, Susan. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, so at the Bennington, so an attendee says at the Bennington Museum, a label suggests a knowledge of harmful lead effects known in ceramics production at the end of the 18th century. And I think that was very much true that, that especially factory owners or sort of people in charge were aware of the effect of lead, um, but the, the actual governmental regulation really made the change. Um, I think some of the more responsible factories, if you will, um, did try to do things to make things safer, but it was very much unregulated until the end of the 19th century. OK, 
guess any last questions if anyone is still holding back? So do you want another question about another area of the world we do not focus on? Do you consider ceramics made by Sargamines to be Majalika? So Sargamine is a, and pronounce, uh, forgive my pronunciation, is a firm that was in France, I believe, um, or it's in Belgium, I can't quite remember. No, it's in <laughs> France. Yeah. And that, that firm did certainly make Majolica um, and probably quite a bit of other things as well. Great. So this is your last moment for more questions, if you have them. And I just want to shout out our amazing um, exhibition designer, David Harvey, and Bruce White, um, the photographer who captured the install shots that we were just sharing with you. Um, they were both intrinsic to, to being able to share with you what it might feel like in the space. Um, also, we're going to post in the chat right now uh, all of our upcoming programs for, for Majolica. There's a program about titled Beautiful and Deadly that's all about, uh, we're looking at lead, very beautiful pieces, but we're also gonna look at other materials from that period. So arsenic glass, um, wall toxic wallpapers, no, arsenic wallpaper, excuse me, and uranium glass. Um, and, and Jennifer Mass will be um, in conversation with Spike Bucklow about that. Jennifer Mass is our um, uh, faculty member who's a cultural heritage scientist, so she can really go into detail about some of the chemistry behind some of these materials. Um, so you'll see those in the chat um, upcoming. So if you want to register for those now, please feel free to follow those links as well. And um, also, uh, our Majolica exhibition is open to the public. If you're in New York or in proximity to New York, please come visit us. Um, tickets are available on our website for timed entry. And um, we'd love to welcome you into the space. It's really quite a spectacle um, walking through our galleries at the moment. They are glittering with Majolica. Um, so unless there are any more questions coming through, I don't believe there are. Oh, a question, a final question here on um, how widespread was Majolica? Were there, were there practices around this in Asia as well? Are we talking much more about just a European phenomenon and the United States or are there other reaches? Yes, there, there was Majolica made in, in China. Um, there was Majolica made in Latin America. Um, there were Canadian factories. Um, there were factories in all the European countries you can think of. And uh, it was a, um, a, a worldwide mania. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, and to, just to say, we sort of touched on this idea, you know, a, a lot of the British and American Majolica, particularly the British Majolica um, sort of represented and sort of presented slightly fetishized um, presentations of other cultures, specifically figures that were um, Black and Asian. So we're really going to dive into that topic for our next program and really give that area of Majolica the attention and time that it deserves to unpack. It's a complex entanglement. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about that aspect of Majolica, um, please join us in October as well. Well, I would just love to say thank you to our curatorial team, Susan, Laura, and Earl. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and sharing time in this virtual space. And enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>